kicking off the list at number 10, Ivan the Terrible. If his name didn't already give you a hint here, Ivan the Terrible was not a great lad. He was rather terrible. His Russian nickname translates to more than evil, so I figured who better to kick off this dark list with than this lad. The first Tsar of Russia back in the mid 1500s. Okay, he created Russia's secret police. Ivan IV enjoyed harming members of nobility and he did so in cruel ways. A ray of sunshine appeared in 1564. Ivan the Terrible officially resigned. And then a year later, however, he immediately came back, so yeah. And then he took control of one third of the Muscovite realms. Not a retirement at all. Right back up on that ruling evil horse, I guess. And then in 1581, he took out his heir to the throne, literally like a Game of Thrones villain. So yeah, he's evil to all those around him and his own family. In our number nine spot today, we have the first beast. This creature is so named because he is quite literally the first beast that is mentioned in Revelation, and everyone just felt like that summed it up well. This creature really is a beast, however, as being described with seven heads and ten horns as he rises up out of the ocean. I'm just saying, the Loch Ness Monster sounded creepy until I heard about this guy. This creature doesn't just have way too many heads and horns, however, no, of course not. He also has the mouth of a lion, the feet of a bear, and is said to have the body of a leopard. Imagine a lion, bear, leopard with seven heads coming out of the ocean. Like, absolutely. No thank you. In our number eight spot today, we have the second beast. Okay, we talked about the first, so of course we also have to talk about the second as well. This beast, rather than rising from the ocean, shows up as he rises from the earth. Rather than ten horns, this one's only got two, but he also speaks like a dragon. The jury is out on what exactly that means, but I saw the dragons on Game of Thrones. I'm not too keen on any of those guys speaking to me. Basically, the whole job of this creature is that he can sort of perform these false miracles that drive people to worship the first beast, and if they don't worship the first beast, beast, well, then he can kill them. I mean, sounds scary enough to me. In our number 7 spot today, we have Leviathan. No, for once I am not talking about the prehistoric sea monster, and instead talking about the biblical creature that inspired its namesake. The Leviathan was a sea serpent monster who had more than one head, which seems to be a sort of theme we're seeing. This is a beast of chaos who is able to be defeated at the hands of God, as said in Isaiah 27.1. In that day the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. Many people believe that the many stories of the Leviathan that are seen in the Bible are actually what inspired the tall tales and legends of a sea serpent monster. In our number 6 spot today we have locusts. If you're new here, there's only one thing you need to know about me, and it's that I absolutely hate bugs. They're gross, they're creepy, they freak me out. But these guys in particular, locusts, well, they truly are something else. In Revelations 9, 3 to 10, it reads, Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns rounds of gold, their faces were like human faces. As one of the ten plagues in the Bible, I ask, where does it end? This sounds like a true nightmare. And listen, we've fairly recently seen devastating swarms of locusts that caused a ton of damage, like in 2016 in Russia or 2020 in India. In our number 5 spot today we have cherubim. When we think of cherubs, we normally think of like a kind of cupid type character, like a sweet little baby angel flying around. You know, nice stuff. Turns out, however, that that is not at all what these babies are described as being. In Ezekiel 1, 5-11, it says, As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side, the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. 
people. Such were their faces. I'm not sure where we got the flying baby idea from, but honestly it seems to be a lot better than whatever those creatures would look like. In our number four spot today, we have giants. I don't know about you, but anything just exceedingly large, I personally think would be terrifying. There are tons of mentions of giants in the Bible, with the most famous probably being Goliath. Samuel 17, 1 to 58 says, And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. There is even the mention of the Amorites, a race of giants, 80 different times. People who study the Bible estimate that the heights of these guys would have been somewhere from 6 to 30 feet, but some mentions claim that these giants were as tall as cedars, which could make them somewhere from 50 to 100 feet tall. Either way, it's safe to say they were towering and terrifying. In our number 3 spot today, we have dragons. I already mentioned the Game of Thrones dragons on here, so really, need I say more? Dragons are mentioned several times in the Bible, and they are actually thought to be a creature that came from crocodiles. Dragons are a terrifying piece of mythology seen in many different ancient texts and cultures, which begs the question as to how and why. Well, many people think that dragons just might be an attempt at giving an explanation to dinosaur fossils that could have been found at the time. At the end of the day, it probably would have been more shocking if these creatures weren't mentioned at all, considering how they were a part of mythology at the time. In our number 2 spot today we have the four beasts. We had the first and second beast, and now we have the four beasts. I mean, come on. These names are starting to get a little confusing, but to be fair, these beasts are certainly ones that are hard to forget. In the book of Daniel, he himself has a vision of four beasts which are said to represent the four empires. All four of them emerge from the sea and are full of destruction and chaos. They run amok with power, leaving violence in their wake, but alas, they eventually pass from the earth. The first of the four is described as being a sort of cross between an eagle and a lion. The next is said to look like a bear who is hungry for flesh. The third is a leopard creature that has four wings and four heads. The final beast is definitely the most terrifying of all and is actually said to be the destroyer of the world in the vision that Daniel has. This beast is said to have ten horns as well as teeth made from iron. In our number one spot today we have vampires. We aren't talking about Edward and Bella today, we are going to real creepy vampires who don't sparkle in the sun. Light. Honestly, I was surprised to find out that there are vampires in the Bible, but according to Proverbs 30:14, there are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, the needy from among mankind. It is said that there are about 50 different biblical verses that are said to either be about vampires or at least that have vampiric imagery. Many people claim that these passages have nothing to do with actual vampires, but I think that's safe to say about pretty much any of the monsters on this list today. There's just a lot of mention of blood drinking in the Bible, which many people connect to Satan himself. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the cockatrice. These creatures are mentioned a few times in the Old Testament, and they are definitely interesting creatures. They're essentially half rooster, half snake. I don't know why they loved mixing animals so much together, but there seems to be some sort of a theme. They are said to be born from the eggs of a rooster, which I'm pretty sure roosters don't even lay eggs because that's hens, but that's not even the wildest part as this egg is said to be hatched by a serpent. These creatures are said to be able to turn people, animals, and plants to stone just by looking or even breathing at them. It's kind of like the Medusa of the Bible, I guess. Number 9. Caligula. Of course we have to include Caligula on a list of evil lads. We've got to go back to ancient Rome for this one. We're turning the clocks back to 12 AD. The Roman Emperor Nero was already making headlines at this point. He was cruel as well. We'll talk about him later on. But then in comes Caligula to change the game in a weird and also cruel way. He loved spending money and showing off. He once had a two mile long boat, like a floating bridge, just so he could gallop back and forth on his horse. And then everyone was looking and they're like, oh great, cool, cool horse and cool bridge guy. We're all so hungry. He would also order his troops to do odd things, like go into the sea and collect as many seashells as possible. Like that's something you do if you're seven years old. You're like, I want all the seashells now. And they're like, you bet. 
and they collect them. They're like, why do we, do we listen for hints? Why are we doing this? He then built a fancy house for his horse in Citadus. Yeah, not a dog house, not like a shed, like a fancy, rich palace. Why you ask? Well, because Caligula was on his way to appointing said horse into the high office. Yeah, Caligula was taken out sadly before this officially was completed, but he was very close to having his horse in the office of consul. Imagine losing your job to this guy's horse. Imagine the things he would have done. He was on route to do some bad stuff. What a weirdo. Number eight, Queen Ranavalona. The last queen of Madagascar, Queen Ranavalona. One of the worst historically. She, was, uh, she had quite the temper, it seemed. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years in total. She's remembered as cruel, violent, and would often choose you know, violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she went mad with power almost instantly. In the late 1700s, King Andrian, originally brought peace to the lands, but naturally there were traditionalists who opposed him. That's not new, that's, you know, we've seen every medieval show, there's people who aren't on board. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king beforehand. And that king repaid said local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, and now she had to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now when said prince was alive, they didn't even get along. And come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Valona the promotion of a lifetime. But rumor has it, of course, is that Rana Valona poisoned the king. Just a rumor, but it is fitting as to what comes next. Rana Valona kept away the advances of the French and the British by leaving bodies of those who tried to attack prior out on display. Yeah, just sitting there on the beach, like some Queen Cersei type stuff. I don't know. I've been watching a lot of Game of Thrones recently, a lot of evil people. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months, this massive buffalo hunt. And well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation during this and of course, exhaustion. And not one buffalo was even hunted. Just poor leadership and deaths, a lot of deaths. Number seven, Jolly Jane Toppin. Okay, getting a little more recent for this one. In the 1880s, Jane Toppin, AKA Jolly Jane, is now confessing to killing 31 people. And with that nickname and that many victims, yeah, I have to talk about her. Jolly Jane Toppin was a nurse working in Massachusetts. She would take care of the elderly, but instead of TLC, Jane would give them morphine and atropine. And to make things even more horrible, if such thing exists, Jane would lay next to her victim after she poisoned them and just would lie there while they were passing away. Yeah, evil, just evil and twisted, right? Just the worst thing ever. She managed to take the souls of 31 patients, but those numbers potentially reached the hundreds. She eventually and thankfully got caught and spent the remainder of her days lying alone in an asylum. Yeah, these killings began when she was younger after a boyfriend dumped her. That was the, the start of her mental decline, apparently. Number six, George Chapman. Going back to the late 1800s again for this guy. He began his career as a Polish doctor, but in 1888, he moved to London, and that's when things got a little dicey. Once he arrived in London, Chapman sought out four mistresses. Not three, not two, four. Despite already being married beforehand, which you probably could have predicted. George was a doctor, he was a cheater, and you could have guessed it by the title of this list, he was also a killer. He poisoned all four of those mistresses with arsenic. Chapman was also thankfully caught and later was executed for these horrible crimes in 1903. This guy was so bad, they actually thought perhaps this was Jack the Ripper but that's been proven otherwise. Isn't that crazy? Like, oh, we thought you were this horrible person, but you're just your own unique horrible person. Nice. Now there's two of you. Horrible. Number five, Anna Ivanova. Anna Ivanova, the cruel ice princess, AKA the Empress of Russia back in 1730 to 1740. Where to begin? Okay, first of all, when you think ice princess, you wanna put a magical spin on it, right? Cause that's all we know. Well, this was Russia in the 1700s. This was not a magical fun time. Not a Disney princess, that's for sure. To celebrate their victory over the Ottoman Empire, Anna Ivanova gave the order to build an ice house, sorry, <clears throat> an ice palace, rather, to celebrate the marriage of one of her maids and a prince. Sounds joyous almost, magical, one would say. Thing is, these guys didn't know each other prior to getting married, so that was weird as is, right? Can't forget that detail. They were complete strangers, but then they were forced to marry each other in a freezing cold palace literally made of ice in the dead of night. They had to ride an elephant as well, as a newlywed couple, poor elephant. And all the guests, they were also forced to dress up like clowns for this entire party. So even if you weren't getting married, you were forced to be humiliated still. All in the name of said ice queen. Yeah, a little different than Frozen, I'd say. A little tiny bit different than Frozen. This Anna is not great. Number four, Nero. Yeah, we gotta mention Nero. If we're gonna talk smack about Caligula and his high horse, literally, we gotta include Nero. This was ancient Rome back in 68 CE. Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. 
he burned down Rome. That's that's pretty bad. That's memorable, I'd say. Dare I say, even more memorable than a horse palace. It's a messed up family, okay. Nero was heir of the Emperor Claudius, the fifth Roman Emperor. He wiped out his entire family in horrible, different, unique ways, dare I say. And historically, it's believed that Nero lit the fire that burned down Rome. But he made it look like the Christians did it. Once all was lost in the empire, Nero took his own life. Yeah, just all bad. Just bad leadership, bad Caligula and his horse, Nero, everything's burning. Rome was not pleasant, not a pleasant time. Dead aqueducts and horrible history. Number three, H.H. H. Holmes. His fascination with medicine began at a young age. He used to perform fictional surgeries on his stuffed animals, always a red flag, awesome. H.H. H. went on to medical school and shortly after finishing, he began killing people in order to steal their property. He then built himself this massive, terrifying custom house that he had to build to include things like secret passages, trap doors, soundproof rooms, doors that locked from the outside with like gas jets on the inside. He even had a kiln to cremate his bodies. Is he the devil? I would say worse than the devil. I'd rather make a deal with the devil than meet H.H. H. Holmes any day, literally. Holmes gets close with women in order to take control of their finances and then later kill them, but he would also require his employees to fill out life insurance policies that named him as a beneficiary. Some of the bodies he even ended up selling to medical schools. How gross is that? Eventually, he was found out, nice, he was caught, and then sentenced, of course, to death. Not nearly enough times. It isn't exactly known how many victims he had, but it's thought to be somewhere over 200. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. The Hungarian noblewoman was every Everything but. Yeah, back in the late 16th century and even in the early 17th century, Elizabeth would meet young peasants and ask them to come work at her castle, right? This is a good day for peasants. She promised them a high paying job as a servant. That's a way better deal than being broke outside of the castle. So many times, if not all the time, these poor folk would come back with her. When they arrived to the castle, that's when things would change. That's when the tone would kind of shift. She would then brutally harm them. She would trap them, torture them, really, just all the worst of the worst. And then finally, once she was bored or ready for the next house guest to arrive, she would finish them off. The number of fatalities here is somewhere around 80 peasants, but historically, that number has also gone up to 600 in some accounts. So 80 to 600. Okay, come 1611, things changed. She was locked up in her own castle with barely any sunlight, nice. She was feeling the weight of her actions. Hopefully she was learning a few lessons here, but four years later in 1614, she passed away. Yet yeah, next to Vlad the Impaler, she's been a large inspiration behind Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah, that's... That's, that's bad, that's, that's really bad. Number one, Mao Zedong. Okay, getting into some pretty high numbers here. The dictator of China from 1943 to 1976, Mao Zedong. He had this vision one day that China would be the superpower, the super country, and in order to do so, he tried to reshape China's economy and turn it into an industrial one. From 1958 to 1962, the Great Leap Forward policy ended up leading to the deaths of around 45 million people. This makes the Great Chinese Famine the largest in human history. Again, this is also an estimate. The deaths were somewhere around 30 to 60 million. That feels like a number one to me. I don't know. I'd say that's a number one. Can't really rate evil and bad, but definitely can't put that at number eight, can we? Starting off at our number 10 spot, we have The Behemoth. One of the oldest books in the Bible is Job, and within this book, there is a gigantic and powerful creature called the Behemoth. In the book, the Behemoth is described as a powerful grass-eating animal whose, quote, bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. This creature is so large, it is described as having a tail that moves like a cedar, and this creature is only able to be tamed by God. One weird thing about this creature is that they really make sure to mention that it has a belly button. Not entirely sure why why that was important, but they made it very clear. It is said that in Jewish tradition, this creature is a primal earth monster as well as a symbol of chaos. In our number nine spot today, we have werewolves. Werewolves are terrifying outside of the Bible, and honestly, I didn't even know that they were in there. It turns out werewolves are one of the world's oldest monsters, and the fear of man turning into wolf-like creatures came long before the times of the Bible. That makes a lot of sense as to how and why these creatures ended up being mentioned in the Bible. I mean, it only makes Makes sense that they would write about the relevant monsters at the time, but what is interesting is that they are never mentioned quite by name and instead just described through like different kinds of imagery. In Daniel 4:33, while talking about someone who fled into the wilderness where he lived like an animal, it says, quote, He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers, and his nails were like birds' claws. 
Sounds pretty werewolfy to me. In our number eight spot today, we have the Seraphim. These creatures are ones that appear in the book of Isaiah, and their name translates to burning ones. That's bad enough, but when you find out that they are flying serpents, things get even weirder and more unbelievable. These creatures, despite their terrifying appearance, are the highest ranking celestial being in the hierarchy of angels. So the good news is, there are creatures on this list who are doing worse things, but the way these guys look, it's really just not what we think of when we think of angels. These burning, flying snakes don't just have one set of wings, and instead have six wings sprouting from their backs. Only one set of wings is used to fly, while the others are for covering their faces and feet. They are said to just fly around, telling God how great he is while using their other wings to hide their faces and feet, because they feel as though they are unworthy of looking at God, and they don't want him to see any of their imperfections. In our number 7 spot today, we have a Bezithabu. This fallen angel is described in the Testament of Solomon and is said to be one of the angels that followed Beelzebub upon his fall from heaven. He is the sin of pride and is known for his ability to lead people astray. He is most easily summoned in the month of July, so coming up quick, during the fifth hour of the night. After his fall from grace, he was left with only one red wing and was condemned to hell. He is said to have control over the imprisoned souls of Tartarus and plays a primary role in the demon world. He himself claims that he was once an angel in what is referred to as the first heaven, and after his fall he began to roam Egypt. During his time in Egypt, he met with Moses and the Israelites during the exodus and opposed them. This is when he decided to harden the pharaoh and his advisors hearts and convinced them to pursue those who were fleeing. He went with the Egyptian army in pursuit of the Israelites, but the collapsing Red Sea crushed and drowned him, which left him imprisoned in a pillar of water. Despite being trapped, Beelzebub says that he will one day return for conquest. In our number 6 spot today, we have unicorns. Did you know that unicorns are mentioned in the King James translation 9 times? That's honestly more than a lot of the creatures on this list. Some believe that these mentions of unicorns might actually be a reference to aurochs, who are a distant, extinct relative of modern cows, but either way, there is one passage that gives us a little insight into these creatures, and that is Isaiah 34, 6-7. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, it is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah, and a great slaughter in the land of Edumia. And the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks of the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Nephilim. These creatures are definitely more mysterious in nature than some of the others on this list, and while there are some things regarding them that people can't quite agree on, one thing we know for sure is that they are large and they are strong. Some believe that these creatures are giants, while others believe that they are the hybrid sons of fallen angels and humans, and some even believe that they are extraterrestrials. So safe to say there's a fair bit of debate. They are mainly mentioned in Genesis 6 1 4. When people began to multiply, on the face of the ground, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh, their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were of old warriors of renown. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Ophanim. So these creatures just in general are very strange. They are actually the wheels that are seen in Ezekiel's vision of the chariot, so they are like creatures, but also wheels? It's a weird one. One of the Dead Sea Scrolls classifies these guys as angels, but there are sections of the Book of Enoch where they are classified as celestial beings who never sleep and instead guard the throne. So while these creatures aren't necessarily terrifying in their actions, they're definitely creepy as heck in their appearance. They are called the Many-Eyed Ones for a reason. It is said that these wheels have four faces and way too many eyes. Imagine having to ride in that chariot. Like, that's just absolutely terrifying and kind of uncomfortable. No thanks. 
In our number 3 spot today we have Raphael. Raphael is one of the true archangels and is the fourth oldest of the five. He is a powerful healer, a guardian angel, and a great fighter so you might be wondering why he landed a spot on today's list. Well, there's just one story in particular that I really want to talk about and that story comes from the book of Enoch. In this story, Raphael is in a battle with the demon Azazel. Raphael is able to defeat the demon but decides to subject him to a fate worse than death. The story writes bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness, and make an opening in the desert which is in Duadel, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever, and cover his face that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment he shall be cast into the fire." If that wasn't clear enough, which let's be fair, it probably wasn't, Raphael tied this demon up, buried him alive in a hole full of rocks in the middle of the desert where he just now gets to wait until he can be thrown into a fire and burned alive. Gotta say, it's really, really dark. <laughs> In our number 2 spot today we have Lucifer. I know that many people interchangeably use the devil and Lucifer as if they are words for the same thing, but it's kind of like how Amber Heard use pledge and donate synonymously. They can mean the same thing, but they don't always, and today we are talking about Lucifer as a separate entity. Lucifer was an angel before he fell from grace. In the book of Isaiah it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Lucifer is now the ruler of hell and he commands an entire army of sinners and demons and he even tried to organize an uprising against God. So I think it's pretty clear exactly why he is a terrifying entity. He also uses his power to send terrible people to earth in order to terrorize everyone as well as to try and tempt non-sinners into the dark side. It is said that Lucifer also might just be the one who is responsible for the original sins that were seen in the Garden of Eden. Some believe that he is the snake who placed the temptation there. In our number 1 spot today we have the 200 million horsemen. Many of us are at least slightly familiar with the 4 horsemen of the apocalypse, but have you ever heard of the 200 million horsemen? Yeah, I hadn't until this list, and they are even more terrifying than just a regular group of 200 million horsemen would be. This is mostly due to their appearance as they are said to have the heads of a lion as they spit fire, smoke, and brimstone from their mouths. Just one would be already terrifying, but think of millions and millions of them. They are also said to have tails like serpents, so we are just continually adding to this horror story. It is said that these horsemen will claim the lives of about one third of humanity and that there are four fallen angels who lead this army. So yeah, I am sure it goes without saying, but this is definitely a group we should all strive to stay away from. Mm -hmm. 